please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19 as we continue our summer practice of preaching the gospel. If you missed the last few weeks due to camping or whatever, we would invite you to go back and listen to the podcast as we put a lot of work into a biblical theology of the gospel as defined not by the American church, God bless them slash us, but as defined by Jesus of Nazareth and the writers of the New Testament and the great tradition of Jesus down through the centuries that spans continents and ethnicities and generations. Now we're ready to shift gears from what is the gospel to, okay, with a basic framework in mind, how do we preach the gospel? in a city that is, for the most part, secular to the core, and increasingly, at a mortal level at least, on a different page than that of Jesus' vision of human flourishing, where a lot of people outside the walls of the church are hostile to the idea of a gospel of Jesus, and a lot of us inside the church are a a little emotionally wrecked by a bad experience with, quote, evangelism. What does it look like in our city in our time? Is it a four spiritual laws tract or a sermon series where you invite your friends to church and just pray to heaven that the pastor doesn't screw it up or talk about politics? Is it passing out C.S. Lewis and Tim Keller books to every single person you know? Yes, by the way. Or is it a Christian concert with a message in between sets? Is it an Instagram story drip feed or an apologetics debate where you watch a Christian intellectual just slay a Darwinian materialist? hopefully, or or is it a bullhorn on a street corner, or a sandwich board sign, or a billboard on the side of I-5 with heaven and hell? A lot of us just cringe kind of hearing some of those examples because those old methods of, quote, evangelism feel tone deaf and out of touch with the cultural moment. But what if the preaching of the gospel could look more like eating a meal in your home with a friend from across the street, or gently offering a prophetic word to a coworker, or bringing a neighbor along to Alpha, or an act of service in your neighborhood, or living in such a way that simply does not make sense unless Jesus was who he said he was and he is back from the dead? Could it be meeting people in the place of pain with love? Isn't that what Jesus did? When we read the four gospels and story after story, where does he go? He goes to the place of pain, the pain of sickness or the pain of demonization or of social ostracization. And he loves people into the kingdom one meal at a time. The pain points in our culture are too many to list. Here's one of the most glaring, all around us people are lonely. According to the Survey Center on American Life, the percentage of Americans who say they have no close friends at all has quadrupled since 1990. 54% of Americans report sometimes or always feeling that no one knows them well. Up to 40% of Americans have zero close friends or confidants. Not only are people lonely, but we all know we're living through a mental health crisis, and the reasons for that, I'm sure, are complex, but one of the most obvious ones is that people in our secular age are living without meaning. The secular life script is great if humans are animals, and up and to the right, more money, more hedonism, and more, quote, freedom to do whatever you want are enough. But if we're souls, if survival and pleasure are not enough for us, then the secular life script is ephemeral. It's a chasing after the wind. And at some point in life, late or early or in between, you come to realize that, and it's a crisis. It stands to reason that Nietzsche said, inside a Darwinian worldview, which was his own, the only two rational decisions are moral depravity or suicide. American suicide rates increased by 33% in the last two decades alone. Major depression rates in youth increased by 63% in just the last few years. My point is that all around us, people are in pain. Could preaching the gospel look a lot less like a sales strategy for Jesus to win converts and a lot more like love? a lot more like the stories of Jesus that we read in the Gospels? Of course, the answer to that is yes. 
Over the next five weeks of summer, the plan is to explore kind of five best practices for preaching the gospel in our cultural moment, all of which work together and generate a kind of flywheel of energy and love. They are practice hospitality, find where God is already working and join him, bridge the cultural divides with Alpha, operate in the manifestations of the Spirit, and live in a way that begs the question. So, to kick it off with practice hospitality for this morning, Luke 19, if your Bible is open, let's read through this story together. Verse one, Jesus entered Jericho, and he was just passing through, but a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector or tax farmer, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Fun fact, in the Greek, it's unclear if he was short is referring to Zacchaeus or to Jesus. Just saying. (laughs) So he ran ahead, and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. So the idea is people are all around, like the buzz, Jesus is in town, and people are running out to meet Jesus in the road. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. This is so Jesus, just in tune with the Father. He looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. Get out of the tree, dude. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they thought it was so kind. No. They began to mutter or grumble or critique. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Notice all the people, not a few, all. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham, meaning this man is in the family of God. For the son of man, that's Jesus, came to seek, to go after, and to save the lost. Now, anybody grew up in Sunday school? Uh, Yes, a number of you. The felt board, am I dating myself here? Like certain things the digital age has just ruined, you know? (laughs) The felt board is one. It's easy to read this story. Um, For those of you that are new to the Jesus story, new to the New Testament, in a sense, you are better off. Because if you grew up with the Sunday school version of this story with the cute wee little man, you know, isn't there a song too? I'm sure Bethany could come up here and sing it. Should we do that right now? (laughs) Should we have her up? Or I value my friendship. Mercy. Mercy toward you, Bethany. But it's easy to read it in that kind of a, oh, cute, the wee little man and Jesus at the table for dinner, as if the moral of the story is kind of, you know, Jesus loves short people too. (laughs) But note verse seven, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. To the original audience, it was not cute. It was, like a lot of Jesus' life, disorienting and disturbing to the status quo for two reasons, or a little bit of backstory here for those of us that are not first century Jews. One, Zacchaeus was a tax farmer, which in that society was the worst of the worst. Israel, if you know the story, was occupied and oppressed by the Roman Empire. It was brutal. The tax farmers were not Romans who you know, were imported in from the Mediterranean, but were Jews who sold out their countrymen to get rich quick. They were notoriously corrupt. They basically made a living by adding a fee on top of Rome's fee, but then they had the Roman legion at their back to enforce it. So Rome could say, the tax rate on your farm is 50%. Somebody like Zacchaeus could come in and say, but you owe me 70%, and you had no leverage because behind him was a squad of Roman legionnaires. And so they were ripping people off and getting rich right and left. You can't imagine how much they were hated and loathed by the general populace. In that culture, the two lowest rungs on the moral ladder were tax collectors and prostitutes. And as we'll read in a moment, who does Jesus eat with? Tax collectors and prostitutes. Now again, most of us in the room read that and think, man, Jesus is so rad. I love Jesus. But notice, that was not how people felt in the moment. 
Um, that's because we don't have tax collectors anymore and IRS agents don't count. We do have sex workers, but our culture is so given over to sexualization that we are numb to that or often people around us celebrate it. But pause for a minute, just right here and now, and just ask yourself, in your kind of moral view of the world, don't like give the right answer, just the honest one, who is at the bottom of the moral hierarchy? Who's at the bottom of the ladder in your view? As one infamous politician put it, who is the deplorables? Who do you view as moral scum? Just right now, draw that person or that type of person to mind. This is most likely the one time you'll ever be told to judge somebody in your mind at church by me. Have that person in your mind. Now imagine Jesus going over to their home for dinner and pouring a bottle of wine and loving on them and eating with them. How does that thought experience make you feel in our, quote, open-minded, but not actually open-minded, progressive city? Angry, scared, or just confused? Yeah, that's exactly how people felt in the moment. Secondly, meals meant more in that society than they do in ours. In every culture, ancient or modern, meals are what the anthropologist Mary Douglas called boundary markers, meaning meals bring people together. The word companion is from the Latin com, meaning with, and pan, meaning bread. Think of like Panera in the, sub in the suburbs or whatever. Your companion is one who you are with over bread or over a meal. But meals also keep people apart. Think of the pre-civil rights restaurants in the South with no blacks sign on the front door. Or in the UK, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Or today, where segregation still exists, but it's more based on class. Think of how the wealthy eat at one type of restaurant, and how the middle class eat at another, and the working class at another. Most likely, wherever you eat, you're not experiencing Portland. You're experiencing your socioeconomic band of Portland. Even, again, in our progressive city, as a general rule, we eat with people that we are friends and family with. Any of you hate, like, the communal dining table thing in Portland? I just rebuke that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> it's the worst when you sit down and you're, like, hoping that it's, like, an airport experience where you're, like, we're just going to pretend like we're not six inches from each other. And they're, like, hey, how's it going? You're, like, no. <laughs> But this is true of all societies, but it was especially true of first century Jewish society. In fact, it was codified into something called table fellowship. And as a general rule, a rabbi in this culture would never have fellowship, table fellowship. He would not be caught dead eating a meal at the home of somebody like Zacchaeus. New Testament scholar Scott Barchi writes, it would be difficult to overestimate the importance of table fellowship for the cultures of the Mediterranean basin in the first century of our era. Mealtimes were far more than occasions for individuals to consume nourishment. Being welcomed at a table for the purpose of eating food with another person had become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship, intimacy, and unity. Thus, betrayal or unfaithfulness toward anyone with whom one had shared the table was viewed as particularly reprehensible. On the other hand, when persons were estranged, a meal invitation opened the way to reconciliation. Another scholar, Jacob Jeremiah, writes this, in the East, even today, to invite a person to a meal was an offer of peace, trust, brotherhood, and forgiveness. Sharing a table meant sharing life. In Judaism in particular, table fellowship means fellowship before God, for the eating of a piece of broken bread by everyone who shares in a meal brings out the fact that they all have a share in the blessing which the master of the house had spoken over the unbroken bread. The inclusion of sinners in the community of salvation achieved in table fellowship is the most meaningful expression of the message of the redeeming love of God. If you're taking notes, that is worth writing down, that last sentence. One theologian I read said, Jesus got himself killed because of the way he ate. He ate with all of the wrong people. Because for Jesus, meals were not a boundary marker, but a sign of God's great welcome into the kingdom. Not a way to keep people out, but a way to invite people in. In fact, notice two things at the end of our story in verse 9 and verse 10. 
First, the line, today, verse 9, salvation has come to this house. In light of last week's teaching, note what salvation here is. Is it Zacchaeus is now going to heaven when he dies? Is it Zacchaeus is at a legal level kind of justified in the court of heaven? Is it passing new legislation in the Roman Senate against tax farming? No. It's there was a soul who was far from God and the community of God and the way of God, and he's been brought back to the table through Jesus' loving welcome. He's been joined into this group of disciples of Jesus. He's turned from his sin. He's made restitution for his injustice, and he is now becoming a part of the new community of Jesus that is being formed into people who one day can serve and steward all creation in love. That here is salvation. Second, note the line in verse 10, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, the Gospel of Luke was written you know, over a millennia before Gutenberg, and it was originally designed to be read out loud in one sitting. If you were sitting in a house church in Antioch or Jerusalem or Ephesus in the first century and you live in an oral culture, your ears tuned into that, your ears would perk up at this line because it's a repeat from earlier in Luke's gospel, back in chapter seven. With your finger here, just turn to the left really fast to Luke chapter seven, just a few pages to the left. Let's just read really quick one other very similar story. Luke chapter seven, Pick it up in verse 33. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, interesting, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Again, bottom of the moral hierarchy. But wisdom, Jesus says here, is proved right by all her children. Or as Bethany would say, the proof is in the pudding, right? When one of the Pharisees, 36, invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table for a meal. A woman in that town who had lived a sinful life, and scholars tell us that was a first century idiom for a sex worker, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there, which by the way was taboo, with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. This, all of this is like beyond taboo in that culture. A woman, as in much of the Middle East today, would never let her hair down in public unless if she was this kind of a woman. And here she is loving Jesus in the one way she knows how. She kissed them and poured perfume on his feet. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus, oh man, never think a nasty thought in front of Jesus, answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, Rabbi, he said. And then classic Jesus just goes into a story. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii. Denarii was a day's wages. So a year and a half, take whatever your annual salary is or income and multiply by 1.5. A lot of money. And the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and he said to Simon, interesting, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, which by the way would have been offensive, a deliberate snub, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, again, snub, but this woman has not stick stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has performed, put, poured perfume on my feet. Meaning this woman, this sex worker, sinner woman, is playing the host, not the Pharisee. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. 
The other guests began to say among themselves, again, they don't think this is, you're reading this, oh, I love Jesus, not them. They say, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. There's our word again. Go in peace. Now, these two very similar stories of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke that we just read, about Jesus and eating and drinking with sinners, with a tax collector in one and with a sex worker in the other, they are not the exception, they are the rule. There are dozens more in the four Gospels. Jesus, as we just read, was called a glutton, a drunkard, and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And while I don't think he was a glutton or a drunkard, he got that reputation somehow. There are over 50 references to food in the Gospel of Luke alone. New Testament scholar Robert Karras writes, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. I like this Jesus. He would do very well in our city. And when he's not eating, he's teaching, and a huge chunk of his teachings deal with food. One of his primary metaphors for the kingdom of God is of a feast. In fact, Peter Leithard writes this, for Jesus' feast was not just a metaphor for the kingdom. As Jesus announced the feast of the kingdom, he also brought it into reality through his own feasting. Unlike many theologians, he did not come preaching an ideology, promoting ideas, or teaching moral maxims. He came teaching about the feast of the kingdom, and he came feasting in that kingdom. Jesus did not go around merely talking about eating and drinking. He went around eating and drinking a lot. Again, I really love Jesus. When Jesus was gathering people around a table for a meal and calling this strange kind of cocktail of disciples and tax collectors and rich and poor and men and women and people across the political divides of his time, he wasn't just eating food and drinking wine. He was forming a new humanity the new kind of vanguard of the kingdom of God that is to live now what one day will become true of all the world. It comes as no surprise that in the book of Acts and in the early church, the table was the center point of the church, not even the stage or the pulpit, and the bread and the wine were the center point of the weekly worship gathering. We've done work in previous teaching series that you're welcome to go back and listen to on our podcast feed about how the meal became the mass, the fascinating history of how what started out as the agape feast, the kind of weekly meal-based celebration of Jesus with all of his followers around a table over the centuries and through the Middle Ages turned into a solemn, somber kind of act of religion with a priest around an altar. This is why each week we practice the Lord's Supper as a full meal around a table with our Bridgetown communities. Because eating a meal together with Jesus isn't a sign of the kingdom, it is the kingdom. It's not a metaphor, it's real life. And this has all sorts of implications for how we preach the gospel. Tim Chester has this great little book, you're welcome to read, called A Meal with Jesus, where he points out that Luke uses this verbal formula, the Son of Man came, twice. One is about Jesus' mission, the other is about Jesus' method. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That was what Jesus did. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. That was how Jesus did it. Jesus lived in a culture where a lot of people were hostile toward him and his gospel, very similar to ours now. How did he walk all sorts of people into the kingdom? One meal at a time. That was his, quote, method of evangelism, if you want to use that language. Again, that language is not used, that that rubric of evangelism is not used in the New Testament, and a lot of us are turned off by it. I mean, I hear it, and I think of, like, the, God bless them, and if you're one of them, we're welcome you're here, but the like, super aggressive salespeople outside Powell's, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I mean, it was, I was there just a few weeks ago, and I always like, put my head down, because I don't want to be the mean guy who's like, do you want to save the whales? No, I do not want to save the whales. But it's just so, I hate it, so manipulative, you know? So I just kind of like, put my head down and walk really fast, and they hire like, the most aggressive and charming people in the whole city. And this girl literally goes to me, I was wearing all black down to my shoes, and she goes, oh, you're wearing all of my favorite shades of black. Can I talk to you? I thought, that's 
that's witty, but no. Um, so a lot of us, like, we think of, like, a Christian version of that, you know, or, or the bait and switch, or the knock, 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 if you were to die, like, all of these, like, borderline exploitative kind of methods, and we just, ah, like, there's a part, not in all of us, but in some of us, that's just, ah, and yet there is an impulse of the Spirit that is deep in all of his followers to move out toward others with the good news of the life of Jesus. Here's Henry Nouwen in his beautiful book, Reaching Out. As a reaction to a very aggressive, manipulative, and often degrading type of evangelization, we sometimes have become hesitant to make our own religious convictions known, thereby losing our sense of witness Although at times it seems better to deepen our own commitments than to evangelize others, it belongs to the core of Christian spirituality to reach out to the other with good news. It belongs to the core to reach out to the other with good news. As the saying goes, the gospel always comes to us on the way to someone else. But when you pay close attention to the four gospels, and all of the stories about Jesus, if you search for like common patterns or a kind of method to, quote, evangelism, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. But best as I can tell, it was basically this. When Jesus was with a bunch of people who already had faith in the Bible and Scripture and God and basic orthodoxy, but just for whatever reason had drifted away, he would stand up in front of a large crowd and he would preach. But when Jesus was with somebody who was on the margins, who had wandered away from the community of faith and from God himself or who had been hurt by the church or for whatever reason wanted nothing to do with, quote, organized religion, then Jesus would basically, he did not open his home because he did not have one, but he would open their home to himself. <laughs> and he would invite himself over for dinner and he would play not just the guests but also the host and he would break bread and drink wine and he would listen and he would offer wisdom and he would bring the conversation deeper and he would attend to people and love people right where they are at and then he would sometimes say come and follow me you're invited you're wanted in my community in this new humanity that I'm forming and this practice of Jesus, if you want to give it a label, in the New Testament goes by the name of hospitality. The word hospitality means something very different in the New Testament than in our modern world. It's philoxenian in Greek. It's a compound word. Philo means love. Think of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Xenos means stranger or foreigner. Hospitality is the exact opposite of xenophobia. It is not the fear or the hate of the stranger, it is the love and the welcome of the stranger. The welcome of all as a guest in your house. Again, Nouwen defined hospitality as the creation of a free space where the stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Rosaria Butterfield as turning strangers into neighbors and neighbors into family. I would define it as just expressing the welcome of God to all through tangible acts of love and service, namely through giving food, shelter, and relationship. And as followers of Jesus, we are commanded all through the New Testament to just continue what Jesus started. Here's a few examples. Romans 12, 13, practice hospitality. The word practice there in Greek, one lexicon defines it as, quote, to do something with intense effort and with a definite purpose or goal. It can be translated, be eager to show hospitality. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. How? Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. All of us introverts and neat freaks, we need to memorize that one. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 22, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Again, how? Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing some, so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. What is that? In both 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, the practice of hospitality is a requirement for elders or leaders in the church. 
I don't know about you, I've heard of stories of pastors being removed for heresy or adultery or funny business with money. I've never once heard of a pastor being removed because he or she did not practice hospitality. But all through the New Testament, we are commanded. Again, leaders are just supposed to live into what is God's call on all of the church. And we are commanded to practice hospitality. Rosaria Butterfield, in her excellent book, which I can't recommend enough, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, writes, radically ordinary hospitality, and that, by the way, is phenomenal language. Those who live it see strangers as neighbors and neighbors as family of God. They recoil at reducing a person to a category or a label. They see God's image reflected in the eyes of every human being on earth. Those who live out radically ordinary hospitality see their homes not as theirs at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. They open doors. They seek out the underprivileged. They know that the gospel comes with a house key. Now, let me make this one thing crystal clear. Hospitality is not the same thing as entertainment. When I say hospitality, a lot of you, you know, depending on where you come from or how old you are, you, you know, you think of Martha Stewart with like the picturesque 4,000 square foot house with a formal dining room and high-end china or whatever. Or if you're, you know, a little bit more Portlandish, the kinfolk kind of photo shoot with like the 50-foot table in the summer backyard with the like the, light, the round light things or whatever, like they have to be the right round, you know what I'm saying? And like just all of these millennial models and like muted linden and, you know, tasteful tattoos and just a little light makeup. Not too much, but just a little, you know? And that's not bad at all, but that version of hospitality writes off a lot of people. Um, how do you do that if you're poor? Or you're not a model? Or, or you share a roommate with like three other single guys, not to gender stereotype, but you know what I'm saying, to gender stereotype, you know? Or you just don't have high-end dishware yet or whatever. But that is not what the New Testament, Jesus did not have any of that, by the way. Not, not a lick of it. And that's not what the New Testament writers mean by hospitality. To compare and contrast, entertainment is about exclusion. You invite the in crowd. Hospitality is about inclusion. It's an open table where all are welcome. Entertainment is about performance. You show off your home or your apartment or your culinary skills or your circle of friends. Hospitality is about service. With entertainment, there's a clear line between host and guest. Hospitality blurs that line. Wherever Jesus went, he was the host. He always came to both give and receive. Entertainment is sporadic. You schedule it out weeks in advance. It's an event on a calendar. Hospitality is a regular, rhythmic way of life. Again, it's core to Christian spirituality. Entertainment is an act of reciprocity. I have you over, now it's your turn to have me over or do my thing or get me a job interview or whatever. Hospitality is an act of generosity. You give and expect nothing in return. In fact, entertainment is a marker of the stratification of our society. You move up the social ladder one party invite at a time. Hospitality is about justice for the poor. Jesus said to his followers, when you throw a party, and notice, by the way, that he just assumed that his followers would all throw parties. I grew up in a church culture where party was a dirty word, you know? And I understand that. I think Jesus here means something different by party than what University of Oregon or whatever it means by party. But he just assumed that you and I would throw parties. He said this, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or your sisters, and I think it's hyperbole here, but you get the point, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. And you're like, uh, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. New Testament scholars point out this is where Jesus and the early church, they, they, picked, a, they picked up on a practice from the culture of the day. Hospi hospitality was and still is in the Near East, very high value. But instead of using it as a way to curry favor with the rich and move up the ladder, for Jesus and his followers, it was a way it was downward spirituality. It was a way to serve the poor. Jesus aimed it down, not up, and it changed the world. 
You see, hospitality isn't just having friends over for dinner. It's reaching out beyond the boundary lines of your friends, across the boundary lines that divide us of race and class and politics and even religion. It's a new multi-ethnic, multicultural family of God coming around the table to eat his bread and drink his wine as a living witness to the powers and principalities that their reign of terror is coming to an end. And a new king and a new kingdom are coming to bear that of Jesus. A whole new social order is the future. In fact, historians argue this is the primary way that the gospel spread at such a rapid pace, from a few hundred people eating together in an upper room in Jerusalem to over half the population of the Roman Empire in just three centuries, toppling paganism itself. Do you see anybody still worshiping Zeus? Not even in Portland. We're weird, but not that weird. No. And they did this with no political power, no legal protection, under waves of persecution and millions literally eaten alive in the arena with no internet, no sound systems, no printing press, no church buildings, no stages, no celebrity pastors. The gospel just spread from one home to the next, from one table to the next over bread and wine, and it changed the course of human history. So many of the things that we just take for granted, we don't realize, started around the table in the church. Did you know that the etymology of our English words for hospital, hospice, hotel, and hostel all come from the same origin, the word hospitality? There's a word for that. There's a reason for that. In the ancient world, there were no hospitals and there were no hotels. Medicine was rare and travel was very dangerous, in particular after the empire fell. The early followers of Jesus picked up on this need for both and came in to fill a void in society. Again, you go to the place of pain. Chrysostom, the bishop of Constantinople in the late 300s, had this charge to his church. Make for yourselves a guest chamber in your own house. Set up a bed there. Set up a table there and a candlestick. Have a room to which Christ may come. Say, this is Christ's cell, that's a monastic word. This building is set apart for him. This came to be called a Christ room and was common practice among any Christians from the middle class and up for a thousand years. As recently as the last century, it's what inspired Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker movement to start their houses of hospitality. Around the same time in 370, Basil, the bishop of Caesarea, founded what historians consider the first ever hospital in response to a severe famine. At his eulogy, they called it a storehouse of piety. It was almost like a small city of social services that grew up around the church he was the pastor of. In time, with the rise of monasticism, both hospitality for the traveler and the hospital for the sick became one of the primary offerings of the church in general and monks and nuns and the monasteries in particular. In the rule of St. Benedict, which was used from the 6th century for over a thousand years in monasteries the world over, Benedictine or not, this is one of the most famous parts of the rule. All guests who present themselves are to be welcomed as Christ. For himself will say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. It wasn't until the 14th and 15th centuries that European cities started to take over the running of the hospitals and the 19th and 20th centuries that welfare became the responsibility of the federal government. All that to say, so many of the institutions that we have come to rely on for human flourishing, from the hospital to the hotel, all started around the table in a home of a follower of Jesus with the practice of hospitality. And if there was ever a time to rediscover our ancient heritage of radically ordinary hospitality, it's now. And our time of just widespread loneliness, that ache of our generation, and political polarization, as we pick up the pieces after a global pandemic and a digital civil war that's ongoing and a year plus of social distancing. Imagine a world where for followers of Jesus, radically ordinary hospitality was the norm, was the rule, not the exception. Now, to be honest, um, preaching the gospel does not come naturally for me. Part of me has been dreading this teaching series for months because, quote, evangelism is a weakness in my discipleship and full honesty, full disclosure, not a strength. 
when you're an introverted pastor like myself, you can delude yourself into thinking that preaching the gospel at church kind of lets you off the hook the other six days of the week. You know, I know that's horrible, but put yourself in my shoes. It's a little empathy, I don't know. I prefer to think of my home as my castle where I wall off from the world rather than as an outpost for the kingdom in my neighborhood and my table as the tangible expression of love for my neighbor. But about a decade ago, or maybe a little less now, my wife and I were just wrecked. It's a very long story. But by a biblical theology of hospitality, you have to be really careful reading the Bible. It will seriously mess with you. It will change how you live. It'll change all of your moral view of the world. And it'll, it'll like lead you to do all sorts of things that are really scary and hard and change you and bless you and transform you from the inside out. And one of many examples of that in my life, where even in coming from a great Christian home and kind of family of origin, that there were just still all sorts of ways where my lifestyle was much more attuned to my culture than it was attuned to the library of scripture. And this was one of many areas where I started to read and started to wake up and started to realize there was a chasm between my lifestyle and that of Jesus. And so I would say we spent the last, I don't know, I spent most of our 30s kind of learning. For me, it was like from the ground up, the practice of hospitality. And I've come to just love it, not that I have it down, but all of the best conversations I've ever had about Jesus with people who don't follow Jesus, at least not yet, have all been over a meal in my living room. So our practice for the coming week is all up at practicingtheway.org slash preaching the gospel. The next three weeks, the practice at an official level is to go through that three-week video course from our friends at Alpha called Life Together. We saw the trailer for it, which is all about how to preach the gospel in a secular age and a kind of a core facet of it is hospitality. But of course, the most obvious takeaway from our teaching this morning is just to share a meal this coming week with somebody who is not a follower of Jesus. Ideally, one you cooked at your own table, but you know, you do you. In closing, remember that hospitality is both a practice and a posture. It's a way of being in the world. It's not just cooking a meal for a friend. It's where you embody and you express God's great welcome everywhere you go. Now one called it a fundamental attitude toward our fellow human being, which can be expressed in a great variety of ways. Even as I speak, what is stirring in your heart? What ideas come to mind? What desires like rumble in your chest? Could any of that be the spirit of God in you? It could be really small. It could be radically ordinary. And yet it could open up a whole new dimension in your experience of life with God. I'm guessing that the vast majority of you are here today because at some level, and we're all different, but at some level, you desire God. You desire what Jesus called eternal life, which he defined as knowing the Father and the Son and their love. That's why I'm here too. After all of these years, if you've been around any length of time, You know my shadow, you know my problems and issues for the most part are on full display for all of you. I promise you this, like below all of the mess that's still there in my life, I ache for God. As Augustine said, I have tasted you, now I hunger and I thirst for more. You touched me and I burned for your peace. Do you burn? At some level, there's their part deep in you where you burn for his peace. You burn for his presence. You ache for more of God. And one of the ways that we experience this God and we burn with his peace is through the practices or the classical kind of spiritual disciplines such as Sabbath and silence and solitude and scripture and many more. It's by going inward We are the temple of God in the New Testament, and we find God at some level deep within, not because we are God, but because we are the temple. We house God deep inside us, below uh, the distraction and the noise and the din and the chaos of our mind and even of our emotions in what the New Testament calls our spirit, is this deep, the Quakers called it the holy center, this deep place where your spirit is at some level one with God's spirit. Not to mesh 
the line between creator and creation, but where we abide in the vine and you're not really sure where the branch ends and the vine begins. And we've said a lot about that aspect of Christian spirituality over the years, that we experience God in silence and solitude and stillness by going within and finding that deep place of center point. But what we have not said as much about, but is just as true, is that we also experience God by going outward in love. Scientists tell us, and this is way beyond my pay grade, but that the universe is expanding. Of course, I interpret that like a scientific idiot and a Christian theologian. And so in my mind, I just think of the Trinity, the Trinitarian community of love we call Father and Son and Holy Spirit, or in short, God as the center of all reality, the creator and the creation. And it makes sense to me that the universe is expanding because the Trinity is just outpouring of love. It's just generous, creative, spontaneous, free giving love to all. A love that goes out. When we participate in this outbound flow of love, from the Father and the Son and the Spirit to all, but especially toward those in pain and even those who are far from the love of God, we somehow encounter God in a different way than in silence and solitude and stillness, but in a beautiful way. As we participate in God's divine hospitality, we too experience God's divine welcome and his love. And that is what all of us were made for, made to receive and made to